clients that we have, we are standing on the shoulders of. And we speak about, we cannot uh, miss uh, Satyendranath Bose when we speak about uh, Einstein. And what we have learned also are that um, there are two types of um, possibilities of the way particles are in nature. So let us assume that this is a Bombay local. Let me see, yeah, okay. So you see, uh, I, I hope that some of you have heard about the local trains that run in Bombay, Mumbai now, and you see how full it is. It's so full that you cannot physically add another person, simply because each one of them is unique and has very special, let's say, identity. So obviously you cannot add another person on this local. But on the other hand, I can add ghosts inside and as many ghosts as I want, right? We can, we can fill up this whole volume with as many ghosts as we want. So the particles in nature, like the electrons or the protons or, or other particles in nature, they are also divided into two categories. Half of them are fermions. They are like the humans and half of them are bosons. So the fermions, you can, they have only one particular state, which means we can describe them by one particular set of parameters called quantum numbers. And of course the bosons, they are like the ghosts, so you can, they, they are identical and you can pack them up. So what is the implication? The implication is that fermions define atoms and molecules and states and so on because they are unique. And when we create atoms using fundamental particles, we are then able to produce molecules and from molecules we can create matter, elements and so on. And then in, in principle, we can create the whole universe. So that really helps us to understand how the universe um, actually uh, came about and how the particles can be understood in terms of models. And these models, just like the periodic table in chemistry, we have something called the standard model of particles. And I'll speak more about that in a moment. However, when we look at photons, they are like the ghosts, you remember, and these ghosts together can give us very uh, many implications uh, in terms of uh, applications to society. And as you are well know that we have x-rays without which we cannot, uh, you know, we were somehow uh, limited in terms of treating, you know, broken bones. So x-ray scanners, CAT scanners, antimatter, uh, you know, it's a reality. Antimatter actually exists and PET scanners use antimatter, nuclear magnetism and so on. I mean, so many things which I will not go into detail, but you can imagine that blue sky research is what made these things possible. So not only in terms of physics, but in terms of uh, surgery, in terms of forensic medicine, in terms of disease control, and of course, uh, uh, treatments which are based on the DNA structure, which was possible only by using a microscope. And how does the microscope work? It is given uh, the light that it has, uh, the light that we have employed to look under a microscope. The light microscope, is limited by diffraction to about um, 200 nanometers of resolution, while a scanning transmission electron microscope has achieved better than 50 picometer resolution. And this is incredible because this has allowed us to see the very first beautiful pictures of the coronavirus. So you see on the left of the screen, uh, the wonderful picture, the protein that uh, makes the coronavirus. And of course, this is what gives us a very good tool and handle on how to make the vaccine for the coronavirus. So this tells us that whatever research we have been doing, I mean, we, we, do not, we are not looking at the uh, end results. However, research has taught us a lot and it gives us the current understanding of the constituents of matter. So how did we know this? And how did we uh, go about doing this research? So of course, uh, we love to smash things together and then we see what happens. And uh, if we smash these two Lego helicopters, they break down by giving them energy, of course, when we give them some energy, they break down, but these are not the constituents. 
we need to give more energy to, uh, to go to the basic constituents if we want to break these two helicopters made out of Lego. On the right here, I have shown you some, um, some balloon experiments that have also been done because there are many, uh, many um, techniques that can be used to look at matter. My, my Lego experiment is very simple, but then there are complex experiments that are happening on the top of the atmosphere with balloons that are filled with detectors and they can take photographs of cosmic rays that are impinging on the, on the photographic material. So those studies have also told us about matter and about the uh, constituents of matter. So let's increase our collision energy because you know in cosmic rays the energies are very very high. However on the earth we, we get low energy cosmic rays that's why the balloons are sent up there. So let's try what we can do. If we increase the energy, what happened is that we got the tiniest possible Lego piece. So we can say that we know about the small constituent of matter. However, using those, that knowledge, we are able to build our atoms, as you all know. So we build together the, the nucleus of the of the atoms and then we build we put two electrons and then the electrons go round and round and that gives us our uh, the universe in fact let's go fast and you know that the whole universe can be understood in terms of making these uh, these elements once we understood all this science we were able to convert that into engineering and into very big implications for the planet as you know so you see uh, so many uh, examples over here and around you, you see examples and we are able to actually talk to each other because of, um, of uh, these kind of uh, sciences that we have been investigating. So yes, let's put a summary again, that the fundamental forces of nature are four of them, electromagnetism that gives us um, light and radio waves and it holds the atoms together. The strong nuclear force uh, holds the protons together because normally they should fly away, but they do not. And we have nuclear force that gives us radioactivity. Because of that, we have the sun that shines and we have our day and night because of gravity and so on. So our lives really depend on these fundamental forces that make up the world around us. So going back in time now, let's think how come uh, we are here, we are 15 billion years old in terms of molecules and atoms. So me and you, we are all made out of elements or uh, subatomic particles that were present just immediately, few seconds or few fractions of seconds after the Big Bang. So there was this big soup of particles and the soup of particles, we have no idea what it was, but then 10 to the minus 10 seconds, there appeared some particles which we might know what they are. And that's what we are studying here at the LHC. Uh, 10 to the, between 10 to the five, minus five and minus 10 seconds, there appeared another soup of particles and that's called the quark gluon plasma. And that's also something that we are studying here at CERN. And eventually, you know, there appeared slowly, uh, as we said before, the elements and so on, when finally we started having galaxies and, and eventually life. And here we are thinking about all that. However, it's not so simple. Do we understand what, what uh, exactly um, uh, how this whole thing came about? And what is the origin of mass? How is the electron and proton so different? Why is the proton so heavy and the electron so light? And what are all these other particles in the soup? If we put together the knowledge that we have gathered and we try to explain with the forces that we have just understood, which means that you know we know the moon is there and it doesn't fall off because of the gravity, right? Um, similarly, there, are, there should be 95% more matter out there and we do not see it. So what is this? And that's called dark matter simply because we do not understand it. There's dark energy. Why at all are we here is another question, which means 
that that why did matter remain and antimatter disappeared because we do not see the antimatter around us and of course we are trying to understand the 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 primordial plasma from which we all came about so yes we know this kind of research blue sky research is really impacting i can say billions of lives because if nothing else the world wide web that was created because of the blue sky research has impacted billions of uh, clicks every day and trillions of uh, dollars in economy so the impact from blue sky research is unfathomable and we have no idea that uh, very small seeds of uh, questions can have very big implications so yes there is this on the left a uh, uh, a fundamental equation that actually explains the whole universe it tells us about the four forces and about the, all the particles that should exist in nature and these kind of theories have been put together as we have moved on in our understanding so the world is made of quarks and leptons as you see on the page and you see on the corner on this side there are carriers of these forces that we spoke about so the bosons are carriers of these forces so the w and the z boson they carry the weak nuclear force the photon carries the uh, electromagnetic force as you know already and of course the strong nuclear force is mediated by gluons and the higgs in this corner over here is a very strange and heavy particle and that explains so to speak the mass of fundamental particles and this theory was put forward by several people together independently nearly 50 years ago by kibel guralnik hagen engler braut and professor higgs and the theory is explained that there is a field of the higgs or let's say some particle which we now call the higgs uh with which all those particles that were formed interacts and the more a particle interacts with this invisible field the more mass it gets now if this field is invisible how can we prove that the higgs exists and that's exactly the challenge that we have had over the last many decades and personally i have been involved in this journey from 1989 which means that we have been playing with legos increasing the energy of the accelerator and trying to recreate the big bang in some way or the other oh what happened when we increased the energy of the accelerator we did not find particles that we expected we found something very different so these are the experiments that we do and we are trying to recreate particles that may have existed at the time of the cosmic soup or at the time very close to the big bang and that's what we try to do in our experiment with the accelerator as you see google was kind enough to give us space when the accelerator started in 2010 and here inside this accelerator we can use the famous experiment that we give energy to protons and in an ephemeric moment these this energy that the proton has converts into mass and we might create uh, particles that were present at the time of the big bang and that's exactly what happens which means that we might create the higgs boson we might create expected particles like you see here many familiar things but we might create a lot of unsuspected and unexpected particles so the higgs boson was predicted to be very heavy you saw that equation and you know uh, physicists have been working over decades to predict what the what the mass of the higgs boson should be so it was predicted to be very very heavy it was predicted to be very rare as well so one in a billion is what you will find so when you make collisions at the uh, collider the accelerator we have to look at a lot of data to then be able to be sure that uh, the higgs boson was actually formed and then it doesn't stay there for us that look i'm here please look at me it doesn't happen like that 
it decays immediately into other particles. So we have to look at evidences uh, on how we could find. And how did we do that? We did that, of course, by accelerators that are the powerful machines. The, when the collisions happen, we need to take pictures of the collisions. And these pictures, we have to take at least uh, 40 million times a second so that over one year, two year, three years, we are able to gather enough data to look at possibilities of creating the Higgs boson. And of course, there are many other factors which I will skip for the moment. Uh, we need a huge amount of computing to collect, store, and analyze all the data that is produced. And all that is done by a vast collaboration of thousands of scientists of some of whom you see on the left of my screen in this uh, building, which is the so-called uh, LHC building at CERN, and part of us have our offices over there. So here is a schema that shows you, um, if you look at the dotted line in the middle of the page, you on the right is France and on the left is Geneva, uh, I mean Switzerland. This is the aerial view of the airport. And you see two, um, two small uh, dots running across in, in, in the, on the circumference, which is 27 kilometers. That's where underground the accelerator is housed. And the accelerator is nothing but another microscope by which we, can, we are able to look at these collisions that we, uh, that we spoke about. So it is a machine. As you see, there are two beam pipes and these beam pipes are cooled because we have um, uh, a very, very high vacuum inside these beam pipes where the protons will run and then we will be able to collide them together. So uh, this is, of course, it's an extraordinary machine. It works at 1.9 degree Kelvin above zero, which is colder than outer space. It is the, the vacuums that are needed are incredible because we don't want to lose the protons, right, before the collisions. And of course, when they collide, that's how a collision looks like and the number of particles that are coming out from each of those collisions. Here is another scheme that shows you how these, uh, these experiments are housed underground, four of them. And my experiment is in France, that is LHC, LHC, CMS. So here, this is my experiment, CMS, and that's in France. And the other experiment is Atlas. Obviously, we need two to corroborate anything that one experiment will find. You can imagine that this is something like a six-storied building filled up with sensors, which are essentially cameras taking pictures 40 million times a second. The same thing is true in my experiment, that is 14,000 tons and a little more because we've been adding more stuff recently. So you can see it looks like a cylindrical onion, which is 50 meters long and 15 meters high. And it is, if you slice this onion, every cell of this onion is like the mobile camera with technologies of state of the art, you know, like uh, silicon detectors or calorimeters or muon detectors. And uh, we can, of course, go into questions when you might want to ask them on the detail of the technologies. Here is the picture of the cavern where I am also working along with 5,000 other physicists. And you see these are the pictures from the workplace where we look at, uh, you know, this is one piece of this onion. As you see, this, this piece itself weighs 2,500 tons, which is already a very big object to deal with. And that's a picture of me at the, at the site where we are installing uh, this detector, as you see, inside the slots that are created, uh, that are prepared to install uh, the detectors. So um, I spoke about the data challenge. The data challenge is incredible. We are collecting, this is already to be updated, I must say, we are collecting 65 petabytes of data per year. And you can imagine the challenge that we have in terms of dealing with this data and in terms of sharing this data, which is of course shipped immediately within 15 minutes all over the world to our collaborators and uh, using grid computing, you know, it's not only uh, Europe, but it's all over the world that we have centers where uh, people are collaborating and instantly um, doing online analyses and the offline analysis. 
So of course, we also have to move towards exabytes. That's the next step, as you can imagine, because now we have come to an end of an era where CPU scaling is now a thing of the past. And now we need to move. And uh, really, there are uh, big, eff big efforts going on in that direction. A lot of artificial neural networks and machine learning technology has been used to look at the data. Here is how one event looks like when you have cleaned up all the debris that has come out that could have been background or could have been other interactions. Here you see very clean data and this clean data is, is something that we have been looking for for a long time. So this is a collision again where you see a Higgs has been produced from the protons and these, the Higgs then decays into two photons. And these two photons have been caught by the detectors that I showed you. And by now we have of course become a Higgs factory. But in summer of 2012, this Higgs was, we had produced 15 Higgses, you know. And of course, this was the biggest discovery of the decade. And it was, of course, it shows like a blip on this, on this picture, but this blip eventually was shown live all over the world in, in uh, conferences. It was shown live all over the world, uh, eventually reaching all new newspapers and so on, eventually reaching the Nobel Committee. And on the 8th of October, Francois Engler and Peter Higgs uh, were announced to be uh, getting the Nobel Prize. And you see the big celebration in that same building that I showed you earlier. And that was our director general at that time, Rolf Hoyer, who all of us, you can see, we are very excited because the Higgs was actually discovered and it was born. And in December 2013, the Nobel Prize was given with the mention that the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by ATLAS and CMS experiment at the CERN's Large Hadron Collider. So you see in 1964, the, the equations were made, but then it needed instruments and sensors and electronics and algorithms and so on, and people of course, to actually confirm the theory. So this is just some, some uh, my, my colleagues from India who, who worked on, on this, I might as well show you. So this is a big contingent of people who, works, who, who have been working from India in this experiment. So now we are very busy understanding how this Higgs boson behaves and how it connects with dark matter and uh, all the questions that I had been bringing up um, previously are the blue sky research that is actually at the moment very, very much uh, the focus of what we are trying to do. So yes, uh, we are looking at various theories. One of the theories is also called supersymmetric particles. And we are trying to look at um, candidates of uh, supersymmetric particles and also candidates for dark matter uh, in our data. The pictures here are of Zwicky and Vera who did pioneering work in this direction. And of course, uh, this is continued by the legacy of what we do. So yes, I mean, we are doing fantastic work. And while this was being done in the previous generation of the experiments in 1990, the World Wide Web was born just as a fallout for sharing um, uh, data between physicists. And this was in incredibly, uh, in, how can I say, impactful for the whole planet. And today, this tradition continues. And it's not only CERN, it's the whole of the, the collaborators are, and the whole of the collaborations are owners of these technologies and the innovations that have come about by using the, uh, the accelerating beams, by using detect, the, all the techniques that we use for detecting particles, and of course, the grid, the grid computing that has come out from all what we do at CERN. So an example here I can show you is about hadron therapy. You may have heard about hadron therapy or maybe you are familiar with that. It actually uses accelerators, accelerating particle beams because the X-ray, the linear accelerators that provide X-rays to cancer patients, they actually um, irradiate a lot of the 
healthy tissues around the tumor. And that collateral damage, whether it's in the brain, whether it's in the heart or anywhere else in the kidneys, the damage to healthy tissues is what uh, kills the patient or the life, the quality of life of the patient uh, is very much deteriorated. However, if one were to use protons or ions when you use in the accelerator, you are able to create a digital scalpel and you are able to deposit the energy only in the tumor. And this facility is now becoming more and more common with ion beam therapy. And there are many accelerators in Europe, in United States, in Japan, particularly using these new uh, therapies. Uh, PET scanners, I'm sure you are aware and you have seen uh, how antimatter that has actually uh, been used here, which means that uh, you create um, uh, trace, radio, radioactive tracing material that is injected in the body. And then that, uh, that um, anti antimatter then is actually uh, annihilating in the activity of the body, wherever the tumors are, and you can then get the photons that are coming out. And we detect the photons just like we were detecting our particles in our detectors um, uh, in the experiments. So these PET scanners are now actually already uh, commercial. And I think in the United States, there is a 2 billion market of PET scanners already operational. So this is just a picture of the detector that we have used in our experiment, pixel detector in CMS. You see that's made out of silicon, many, many layers of them. In total, I think they are 600 meters, oh no, I'm sorry, 220 meters squared. But then these detectors can also be used to make very beautiful imaging contrast uh, pictures, right? Similarly, you see uh, detectors can be used to make 3D images and also the contrast between bone and tissue and organs can be uh, made by material separation using these detectors and the electronics and the algorithms that have been created. And this is a picture of the wrist of one of the collaborators who has been developing uh, and using these detectors for color X-ray uh, detection, which is incredible. And I think that the delight of doctors and uh, um, and uh, clinicians, and you can see that this has been one of the very big hits on the CERN site, and I hope this works as well. You see, this is the way uh, the doctors will be able to see uh, bones inside our body, and this is the ankle which, which you can see. So these are very impressive um, spin-offs that have been coming out from our Blue Sky research. Here you see, for example, uh, calculations of dose rates along trajectories of, um, of uh, for example, the, the International Space Station or even the, um, the, the pilots that are going in aircrafts, simply because you know, the, the healthy dose needs to be determined. And a lot of the algorithms that have been worked out for, from the radiation, treat, uh, the radiation measurements that we do uh, are coming from here. So yes, we are, I, I'm always very proud of, uh, you know, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was 23 year old when he had proposed the World Wide Web. And here we are, we have completely broken down the whole world in terms of uh, communication, because today communication is a given. Uh, 30 years ago or 35 years ago, when I flew for the first time from India, my parents had to wait five days to know that I have landed and that you know, uh, they could get a letter from me. So communication has completely changed. The algorithms and informatics has completely changed. Uh, education has, has changed, you know, meteorology and earthquake mapping and so on. The impact on money and hum human life is incredible because of the uh, kind of tools that have been developed communication wise as well and data handling wise as well. So this, these have been um, very, very uh, big implications on humankind from Blue Sky Research. So this is just to show you some part of how radiation management itself, which means you know, uh, waste management or 
radioactive waste management, movement of radiation, and so on, that uh, uh, gets a big impetus from the big data handling uh, and also the algorithms that have been coming out from our experiments. There is a lot of experimentation that's going on with the support of CERN with, um, in space. And there are several experiments that you can see here which are going on in astroparticle physics, in astrophysics, and in cosmology. I will not go into details of each one of them, but you can see that there are a lot of implications where this is, at the moment, completely blue sky research. We do not know what's going to come out of it, but then we are very, um, let's say, excited about it. And you can see that one fine day we also had uh, Richard Branson, who came to CERN, and he was excited to have some prospects of collaboration. This is just an example, a very recent example. I think it was in June that this young lady was a technical student at CERN, and she learned uh, to, to use um, a lot of the algorithm uh, and the randomness uh, that we use in our data. And she immediately pr produced a gadget to be able to monitor the temperature of the body, you know, for COVID uh, recognition. And this was incredible. And of course, the, fer the female fertility cycle and so on. So now I think she already has a company within a month or two, and she is probably going to sell this off for millions in the end of the day. I mean, it's not the millions that I'm speaking about. I'm speaking more about the impact that's happening. And of course, lots of other things, other examples you can see. This is another high energy physics community that has risen to the challenge and has, um, has designed a ventilator. So if any one of you is an industrialist who wants to make um, the high energy ventilator um, marketable, here is an opportunity for them. This is our collaboration, just to flash to you. The... One question. Yes. Small question about the ventilator. How... Please. How is it better performing than the regular ventilators which are right now working in the market? The regular ventilator, the ventilators come in many different uh, qualities, I would say. You know, there are cheap ventilators and there are ICU grade ventilators, right? And they are very expensive. So this ventilator is a cheap ventilator, but with the efficiency of a high grade ventilator. So that's a huge differentiator then. Thank it's you. It's a huge differentiator, absolutely. And if you need details, just get in touch with me. Send me an email. Sure. Okay, so yes, the collaboration. I wanted to once again emphasize the fact that I am not alone when I speak about the discoveries, the experiment, the infrastructure, and so on. There are so many people behind, and there are thousands and thousands of young students as well who work a lot in terms of really being the backbone of what we do at CERN. So yes, large collaborations have been successful and all these, uh, let's say, whatever you see popping on the screen is something that I have learned when I came to CERN. Uh, as a student, I didn't understand much on how to manage these big collaborations and how at all can we come to a single point of success? How do we define that? And those things were big learnings on how large collaborations can work. And I think that this is for us something to take to our communities, to our countries, on how we can form uh, um, collaborative efforts where we can do very big uh, impacts in our countries as well. So giant leap for physics means that the LHC 27 kilometers is now uh, going to be operational until 2035. And then comes the next machine. But just as a, as a quick fact, LHC was approved in 1985. It started operation in 2010. So you can imagine the gap. And similarly, FCC is now the direction that CERN is going to push for, and the machine is going to be 100 kilometers. So I'm going to stop there for uh, um, any questions on up to, up to whatever I have said uh, up to now. Okay, the rest is really about what I do personally and so on. So shall, I'll just maybe stop for a moment and take some questions and discussion, then we go further. Hello, I'm still there.
Yes. Oh, I can hear you. Yes. There is a question from Sean and chat. Yeah, go I'll, I'll go to the chat then. Let's see. Yeah. Can you read out the question for some reason? I can't see the chat. Yes, I can. I can read that out. Any collaboration research on Bose-Einstein condensate integral differential equation, any quantum computing research at CERNs, any Absolutely. research on the quantum Fourier transforms. Okay. I'm hmm. going at the CERNs for the graviton. Okay. Okay. Let me say that, uh, first of all, the, the question about quantum computing, indeed, there is uh, an effort on quantum computing that has started a couple of years ago. There is a group that is working with industry, together with industry. So I would encourage you to get in touch and also if you wish to uh, to go in that direction because making qubits and making quantum computers is certainly a very big challenge and uh, although we at CERN we are uh, you know we do research we do we are not an industry as such so we are working on the aspect of how quantum computing can help us for the future of computing uh, for our own data analysis you know so there is this this uh, new thread that has started and it's not only a thread it is a collaboration and there are people in charge and uh, certainly i think one of the next actions could be for you for this uh, community to invite one of those guys to give you a lecture on, on the quantum community computing at cern another question is from john why was it so important to discover the higgs Okay, so um, just like to understand the nature of, uh, of the universe as such, to understand the recipe of how this whole thing came about, we want to understand the, the, the way this whole thing works. We have understood uh, the creation of atoms, molecules, and so on, and we have created a, a periodic table. And many predictions were made in the periodic table and those elements were eventually found. Similarly, the standard model is a very successful theory. It's a very successful model where by means of equations, we are able to predict every particle. So the, how the proton is made, how the electron comes out, how the neutrinos are there. And all these particles are together in a certain um, uh, you know, uh, how can I say, parameterized manner, which means that they are not free to be there. They are there because of these equations and these equations spin out these particles. Even antimatter was coming out of, of these particles by Dirac, by Paul Dirac, in fact, because there were two solutions to the, to, to, to the, to the, to the wave function that he, he postulated. So now, um, how did these particles get mass? This, is, this was a question that was posed by, I mean, that will be asked. Why is the proton so heavy and why is the electron so light? So how did this come about? How, uh, because in the beginning there was, there was no, there was no uh, differentiation. All particles had no mass and they were just freely flowing around. But then at some moment of time, there was the whole universe was permeated by a field called the Higgs field. And then each particle interacted with this field and the amount of interaction resulted in the mass that it got. So, so that was the last part or the pinnacle of the standard model that the Higgs should exist. And that is why there are masses in, on for all these particles. But we had not found the Higgs up to now simply because it was very heavy and we could not create it in any of the previous generation of accelerators or colliders. So it was very important to find it, to conclude that the standard model is indeed one of the best models that describes the universe around us. I hope that answers your question. I think that does. And there is one follow-up question before we go on to the antimatter questions, which we are getting in the chat for you will ask uh, the same continuation question from Sean as about, is it true that the Higgs only supplies 10% of mass? How do you feel the other 90% is contributed? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, if the question is about the missing matter in the universe, I could speak maybe a phrase on that. The, 
the thing is that we all have all heard about gravitational lensing and we have all heard about uh, the way the um, you know the the galaxies the way they move they they give us clues that there should be something out there why uh, which we are not able to to observe and and uh, that has told us that there is 95% out there of something that is not matter that could be some other state which we call dark matter but please uh, i i mean i do not understand that so so well that i i would be able to explain anything more on that you know we are looking for candidates if 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 in the in the collider if we can form a a particle of of dark matter or a candidate dark matter um uh, you know that a decays of dark matter because there are theories that explain this and if we can find candidates of dark matter this would be the next big thing that we can find and we can try to understand and explain uh, you know the the remaining dark matter of the universe sure thank you and and then i'm coming back to one of the entire matter question from bombardi he said you mentioned entire matter during the presentation interestingly dirac discovered the existence of positron yes. through mass he is quoted to say my equation was smarter than i was do yes. you think the rule of mathematics will be even more important over the coming years absolutely correct because we are i mean it was uh, it was bizarre wasn't it because you can't just ignore a part of an equation which was being done up to up to that point because when he looked at all the quantum physics and he created his equations it, it was incredible that he said that there should be something else as well you know the electron is there but the positron should also be there and then two years later the positron was actually discovered in cosmic ray experiments so this was a very, it was a pinnacle of the success of mathematics i would say and i think in the future we just have to continue on this road to understanding the recipe of this universe and uh, you know a lot has to be learned about antimatter you may have heard that at cern we created antimatter anti hydrogen was created and you know to to keep it is the problem you can create it but then it disappears so traps have been made uh, for anti hydrogen that can now keep it for 15 minutes so a lot of studies are needed lot of mathematics are needed and of course the young generation is now to take over whatever you know the the previous giants have uh, have given us i think i will take liberty of just adding one comment here about mathematics so yeah. i was student at grad physics and i deliberately shifted to physics that i will run away from mathematics the yeah. first class i was given was classical physics okay. classical mathematics basically and then i again ran further to computers and again yeah. i got mathematics so mathematics is integral and the foundation the way i finally realized over years yes. and ai and ml and all the advancement on computing side is right. again very mathematical foundation based right I, and that I let's think, go to, yeah sure as no, i want something no i was just saying that i cannot agree with you more because in my personal experience i have had i have had a handicap you know uh, when i studied mathematics uh, there was a gap between what i studied at school and then what i was thrown at when i started my research work so the gap took some time to to catch up and uh, when i finally started understanding the beauty of mathematics for me it was too late to change what i had started working on so uh, indeed another life and another career i would choose to learn much better and uh, learn or and use the tools of mathematics better indeed very very truly stated and I, i'll jump to the next question from abhishek and he is asking essentially ma'am does some think of mass producing entire matter on the scale of a few grams what are your thoughts on tabletop micro sized particle accelerators okay um i in my humble experience i'll be able to share what i understand about this field there are new directions for accelerators that are being taken and they are called wake field accelerators and uh, they are in a embryonic stage at the moment but if that technology takes off we will come to tabletop accelerators but whatever i see and hear and understand 
I think this is not anywhere coming before the year 2045 or 2050. So uh, it's a long horizon, but you see the FCC, I mentioned the 100 kilometer collider is going to be operational in 2045, I think, or 40, sorry, 2040. 2037, it will be commissioned, 2040, it will start. So uh, by then the Wakefield technology should be mature. And if by then people start looking at tabletop accelerators, this is something to be thinking about. And I think you are absolutely correct that we should be uh, moving in parallel directions because this is very expensive uh, research as well. And we certainly cannot feel entitled to public funding to continue uh, these kind of billion dollar only to run the experiment uh, per year that we spend. And the concluding question he had is about would this democratize particle research leading to more discoveries? Obviously, yes, but I'll let you weigh in on that. Uh, sorry, just I, I missed well, one, one second. I missed the question. Would this democratize particle research leading to more discoveries? More discoveries. I think it is but obvious that even if we have no discoveries is a discovery because it's still teaching us about how the world works and what is missing in the standard model. Um, what are, you know, dark matter, dark energy, we already mentioned. Uh, we want to understand about the behavior of the quark gluon plasma. Is there, are there other states of matter? Are there other dimensions? We, we didn't speak about that, but if there are other dimensions, you know, and you may have heard about string theories and there was, which was very fashionable. So there are so many things to learn and to, uh, to look for. But my very personal, uh, let's say, take on whatever we are doing in blue sky research is also touching uh, humankind. Because today the whole world is looking at scientists to provide a cure for COVID-19. And the scientists are, are working very hard to do that. And this is possible because we can stand on the shoulder of the, all the science that has been done before. You know, there are tools. Uh, Higgs discovery was made by a tool. So tools are something very important. So innovation and uh, equipment is something that comes out from blue sky research. So on the one hand, you know, where the theorists are enjoying the formulae and they are enjoying the, the mathematics, experimentalists are enjoying their tools. And then of course, the whole of humankind is here to make use of the tools and the algorithms that are coming out, right? Yep. Thank you, Arshan. I think we'll, uh, we are done with all the questions we had in the chat and we can now go to the rest of the section. Yes. Yeah. Tell me. So I think you wanted to uh, finish the rest of the slides further? Uh, okay. I think in the questions, they all came up, you know, all my points that I wanted to mention, they came okay. up. Yeah, I think we can wrap up. Uh, I, I can just mention that I also run a foundation in India. And if there's anybody who wants to give a hand there, I maybe I can just share one. Okay. Yeah, let's, hmm. let's see that detail yeah. if you can show the foundation details. Okay. Would you mind giving me uh, sharing rights again? Okay. I'll do that. Just a minute. Um, yeah. While we are doing this, uh, I want to thank you for the great talk. Um, I really like the analogy with the ghosts and humans on the train, which is uh, very appropriate for India and the spiritual people there, right? <laughs> well, when that I... was a clever way to explain uh, Bose and Fermi statistics. <laughs> That's really clever. That is true. I must say, and I have to give the credit to somebody else. There is a theoretician mm -hmm. by the name of um, Alvaro de Ruhula. He uh -huh. is incredible, and uh, I attended one of his talks when I was a kid, you know, and, and he, kid meaning that when I came to CERN early, um, in my early days, and I loved his, his uh, explanation. He, he used, mm -hmm. of course, another example, but then I liked the ghosts, and I, I stayed with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to yeah, share. No, I can just transfer this hosting to you. So. Thank and, you. Yes. So um, let me see, where is my foundation? Do I have it here? No. 
Okay, so well, this is one page of my foundation. I don't know where the other pages disappeared. No, they are here. Yes. So this is what we are doing. Can you see my screen, guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, what I'm doing really is because of my own experience, my own lacuna that I, I had, particularly that I did not have enough experience, uh, despite I was in one of the premier labs of the country, I was unable to, to be very familiar and be at ease with hands-on instrumentation. So I felt that uh, it took me some time to catch up and that can be accelerated for the younger kids uh, in India. So I run this foundation called Life Lab uh, Foundation for Education and Research. And young children, I try to interact with them as much as possible when I go to India. And we have started laboratory classes as well. We do, of course, lectures is now, of course, uh, very familiar to everyone, but we do have hands-on uh, labs. We made cloud chambers, we make detectors, we do, do several activities, and there are many things that have been happening. You can see that my students, they are coming to CERN as well, and uh, they are supported by number of people in the country and number of people outside as well, which, by which we can be, uh, all this is facilitated. Once even Prime Minister Modi came and we were able to meet him with many of the students who were here. Okay, then the other thing I wanted to mention was about um, about this slide, <clears throat> excuse me, this slide is that uh, which we spoke that which is why I was hesitant, you know, that in every domain particle a particle physicist can actually make a difference. So it's the multidisciplinarity that the skill a particle physicist um, learns in his or her lifetime or career, where you start with a little sensor, whether it's a, you are participating in the hardware or in the electronics or in the software, you start in that creative period. It lasts about a, a decade nearly because you have to finalize something that has to operate in a very high radiation environment for 20 years, 30 years, something like that. And then of course you deploy it in the experiment, you observe what you study over the, the next 10 years with the data and so on. And these skills that you have learned, even including people management are what uh, come back to you. Because 90% of our doctoral students and postdocs, they go off to industry. And the industries where they have gone out are shown here on this slide, which include banks, financial management uh, institutions, risk management institutions, big engineering institutions, space scientists and astronauts, astrophysics, cosmology, medical imaging, I already showed you these examples big industrial applications because they are like accelerators like safety management and so on then of course meteorology and education outreach as well including project management so just wanted to showcase that blue sky research really is creating a very special value multidisciplinarity that's what i wanted to add Thank Dr. Rasha, may I ask a question here on this slide, which is catching me, catching my eye, and that is project management as an outlier. Yes. I mean, particle physics, particle sciences, and that arena, how is that connected? I'm just curious to understand if you could elaborate we, an example. Absolutely. I can give you my own example. You know, I used to think of myself as a great scientist, great meaning, you know, in my little corner, great inside my home. So um, I started uh, with R&D and I worked on R&D for 12 years in one laboratory with about 10, 15 people, right? Then I moved in an experiment called CMS and in the center, you see, that's my experiment where anything in red is a magnet and anything in gray is a detector. So I worked on, on uh, first in the laboratory with about 20, 25 people to build these detectors over five, seven years. And wow. these, 20, these 20, 25 people were coming from different countries. There were eight, 10 countries. And those 25 people were stationed at CERN, but had uh, groups or teams working back home in their countries. 
So if there is someone coming from Germany or from Italy or from France or from India, China, United States, there were teams behind them and management uh, for coordinating equipment that has to measure 10 microns, 50 microns, once it is installed in this experiment, but it has to fit together with pieces coming from all over the world, you know? So uh, moving from that phase of ensuring uh, detectors coming from all over the world, which were installed in this particular uh, place, uh, you know, in the experiment, uh, is a task that then becomes a coordinator's task, you know, starting from uh, uh, managing the, the technology, then you start managing the work that is being done in different various corners of the globe. If then, then in my particular case in 2010, I proposed a new technology into CMS, which means uh, I had actually, let me see if I can just go there one second, if you permit me. Since you're asking me the question, I am very proud, you know, to show you uh, what I have been doing. No, absolutely, please. Thank yeah. you. I hope I can find, uh, yes. Because all other things were very conceivable in the mind, but project management coming yes. from that side was a real <laughs> curiosity, which I wanted to Certainly. Ask. So here, this is me here, and this is one piece of a detector, one piece which is one meter long and 50 centimeters uh, wide. And we have made 500 pieces like these coming from 16 countries and 300 collaborators. And they are going to be fitted inside CMS over five years, you know. So in total, it is 1000 meters squared of sensitive detector that has to be fit in there. So project management means you have to start ensuring that the detector has the electronics component. So there has to be electronics coordination so that whatever sensitive uh, sensor that you have can be read out and passed on to the computing part uh, of the experiment. And this coordination needs to be done as well. Uh, coming to, um, let's say the physics part of it, which means that the sensor can actually work. It can actually work in tandem with the rest of the CMS. You see, it's not just one piece here. You remember the whole of CMS is very big. There are many, 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 many other detectors. In total, I think there are 100 million channels that are giving you information. And I bring in, for example, let's say I bring in half a million, right? Wow. And this half a million has to be in tandem with everything else. That itself is another coordination. The yeah, physics, match, yeah, the matching of each of the, of the points of uh, uh, the, you remember that? this picture yeah. yeah yeah this picture and this picture all these are you know this is like you have to sift through data millions of data points to actually come to this picture so this is another coordination so i have a team of 20 coordinators who work together with me to ensure that the rest of the you know chain also works properly now coming to the funding, I mean, how do, how do you get, a pro, get into this project? My project in total is about $25 million. So how do I manage that? I need a resource coordinator, isn't it? Right. <clears throat> I need to have a cost profile because I do not need all the money together, but I need uh, the surety of a commitment of having the money when I need it, you know? So uh, it's a long process of first asking for the money, getting the commitment, getting the money in the right time, uh, buying of uh, materials in the right time, components, shipping them around the world. That itself is in it, uh, you know, a big job to be done. <clears throat> so I hope, I mean, I have given you a little insight on part of the work that I have to do, which for the moment is mainly project management. Wow, no, that's that's huge collaboration, coordination, and it's like all the elements of big data coming together as well for each of your experiment, and then each of them is funneling part into your channels and whatever way you're using that for your final conclusions or final input to some some other subsystem or whatever way. Correct. I mean, each that's of huge. 
Yeah, this sensor is giving information and the sensor has to be made to the right dimensions. It should fit with the piece coming from China, which is a mechanical piece, and it should fit with the opto hybrid that is coming from Belgium and, you know, and so on. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's like building a little engine, let's say a small engine in my case, but with pieces that are coming from all over the world, ensuring the technical specifications, ensuring the integration, the technical integration of the whole thing along with the science, of course. Yeah? Absolutely. Thank you yeah. so much. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, over to Balaji. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it was so wonderful uh, again. Balaji, I think you are on mute. No. Uh, Balaji, you are on mute. Anything. I'm sorry. So uh, my question was about the um, Indian philosophy, uh, Vedic um, philosophy, which has a lot of insights uh, about, uh, you can say, maybe a particle physics, because they uh, those days they did uh, kind of uh, meditation based, uh, uh, thinking their own body is a quantum machine. And um, this they analyzed with uh, different uh, techniques, but uh, that can be translated uh, to the modern science, I feel, because I see uh, Nadraja's, uh, Nadraja's uh, statue in front of CERN also. They, uh, they uh, see that statue, I mean, uh, the uh, Nadraja's uh, uh, dance is a kind of a cosmic dance which um, creates this universe. So they symbolically, they put that in before the stern also, I hear, I saw that. Um, so they have some um, openness to other cultures uh, insight, probably uh, Vedic culture also can give some insights to that. I posted the link uh, about uh, Kyusan gate, that is quantum Sanskrit gate, which can bridge these two philosophies of uh, modern quantum science and uh, Vedic uh, science. So I was thinking, is there any possibility we can, uh, it can be a, a kind of project um, that can... Um... Yeah, I mean, um, from the limited, uh, uh, let's say, exposure I have had on this field, because certainly every time I speak on the subject in India, you know, we are proud Indians. We are proud of our heritage and proud of the Vedic knowledge that we have. And the, the Vedas that have actually described a lot of the sciences in uh, in the knowledge that has been contained there if you may have heard of trigun trigunayat uh, and trigun uh, which are the three quarks that are mentioned in the vedas somewhere you know okay. and there is the um, hiranya garbha you know the cosmic uh, energy that is also mentioned in the vedas as well however you know being a scientist i think unless things are corroborated scientifically we uh, we cannot uh, speculate. So my humble uh, submission would be, and it has been already because I have collaborated with people working in the field, that they um, embark on the scientific journey of documentation. Because in India, you know, we have a lot of information from our heritage. However, there is a lack of documentation. So this is an aspect which has been given a lot of uh, emphasis by many people and there are efforts going on and every now and then you will hear about a book launch of this subject so people are putting in a lot of effort there speaking about the nataraja i think it is uh, we can sort of be proud that as a, as indian uh, we have an indian symbol there of cosmic energy i, I will only re relate that to cosmic energy because dance is also a form of energy and the Shiva's dance, Nataraj, is a symbol of a cosmic dance, Tandav Nritya, as it is called in Hindi. So, um, yes, it is a symbol of energy and I think that's where the analogy should be stopped without going into uh, speculation of what it could be or would be. If we have corroborated documentation, then as a scientist, I will engage. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's very rightly stated, uh, Dr. Ashna, in the sense that we saw so many things and we saw so many things coming true in the 
newest world, even in the COVID world, going from the past, coming from the past. But obviously, which we always were thinking as children and as we grew up was that something is coming right, but yes. some rationale and the part documentation and the part of why this is done this way was missing because over maybe generation being the oldest of the civilization which we are from, they passed on the final results and somewhere supporting reasoning was missing because yeah. that was either lost on the way or it was something not properly propagated across. Although our Vedas are tremendous uh, treasure of uh, that heritage and that of course. information, but that that's again, a lot is going on in terms of deciphering that and there are a lot of missing pieces to elaborate every single component as I take example of your particle accelerators and the multiple channels and huge number of million channels. And then now finally you're using the final results and you are taking them into the final product and final utilization onto where we take it next. So that's, that's where we are from and we have those challenges, but at the same time that uh, we are proud that whatever we saw, those things had some substance and there was uh, a reason to it. Fully yeah. agree. Fully agree, Viranji. I have a question on, on the chat uh, from Bamborde. Uh, yes. Balaji, can I take it? It's about uh, the witness of construction of a super accelerator over the next two decades. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can say that I did mention about the next, uh, first of all, the present accelerator is being upgraded. It will start operation uh, already in 2022. We are, is it correct? We are in 2020. So in 2021, it will start. If COVID permitting, you know, if we are delayed, we can't say. But we will start middle of next year and it will run until 2025. After that, uh, there will be, again uh, another three years of stop where we will upgrade the present uh, accelerator and it will run until 2035 and then a new uh, accelerator will then this fcc which i was speaking about future circular collider of, of 100 kilometers circumference will be ready by that time which will be put into operation between 2035 and 2040 so yes there is a very big push in this direction and supersymmetric particles, I mean, if we are lucky, we might find them, you know, even before. So there's, there's a lot of many, many open questions that are there. And we hope that we will get surprises as well, not only the expected uh, particles that we are looking at. Because surprises is where science changes course and, uh, and uh, we will have fantastic new open doors to go into. Okay, Balaji, I think we can wrap up now unless there is another, some other burning yes, question. Last question about uh, the student participation as a volunteer. Uh, I mean, Abhishek has mentioned, is there any possibility to get involved as a volunteer or? Uh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, please, please connect with me on LinkedIn or, uh, or on Twitter or because I'm quite active on, on media. So uh, just get connected with me and I will tell you how and what to do because it all depends on the level of the students. If, if he's in school, there's something else. If he's in university, there's something else and so on. So research students uh, would do something else. So I can take it up separately. And I usually answer all my, uh, the queries that come from the media also. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we can conclude it's more than one hour, one and a half hours we took. Uh, I mean, uh, thanks for presenting a great yeah. insightful uh, presentation about the quantum particles. Um, so uh, we'll uh, post this uh, video recordings in the Meetup page. And um, if anything, uh, questions, uh, you, you can also uh, ask, ask the speaker directly through email. Uh, thanks for all coming. Thank you. Thank you all for making time. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, is it Helen? Hi, Joe. Sorry, uh, the meeting uh, just now finished. I will send the recordings, though. Are you there? Hi, Joe.